So, Jonathan, welcome back to the second series of A History of Coffee. It's such a pleasure to be here, James. <laughs> this is great. Two years later, after the uh, first series came out. Yeah, absolutely. We are enjoying a coffee here in Cafe 1001. It's in the Truman Brewery off Brick Lane in East London. Awfully trendy. It is hyper trendy. I am <laughs> wondering what we are doing here, James. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what we're doing here. Okay, James, have a look around. Tell me what you see. There's graffiti on the wall, exposed concrete. There is a Ranchilio Espresso machine. They are actually the sponsors of this second series. And we'll be talking a little bit more about them in the break. But um, in terms of like the people, so I'm seeing a group of people studying and debating. I'm guessing what must be a history assignment at university. I'm seeing a couple, maybe they're on the first date, gazing lovingly into each other's eyes. Absolutely. In this case, everyone is being social. But the thing that has always been a feature of coffee houses and has always led coffee houses to be viewed with some suspicion mm -hmm. is the fact that people get together and swap ideas in coffee houses. People, usually authorities, are very worried about what they might be saying to each other. Um, now I'm thinking back to the beginning of the story of coffee and um, you know, as it slowly spread from Ethiopia to Yemen and across Arabia, you know, up into Turkey, they experienced coffee for the first time. So what kind of effect would that have had? Well, it's highly confusing for the authorities because here is a beverage that brings people together outside the mosque, talking to each other. It's no surprise, James, that fairly soon after coffee first makes its appearance in Arabia, there are people trying to ban it. So in Mecca, for example, there are people who are not even meeting in a coffee shop, they're just meeting outside a mosque to enjoy coffee together, and the governor tries to get them shut down wow. and get coffee banned. Because people coming together and exchanging ideas... Could be seditious. Mm, dangerous. Dangerous. Mm. Very dangerous. So really, coffee and the idea of the coffee shop, it sounds like a, quite a revolutionary concept. Absolutely, and it continues to be throughout coffee history. Hmm. You know, the coffee shop is the location of so many meetings that transform our societies, whether that's politically, whether that's scientifically, whether that's through literary or cultural types of endeavors. Mm. So on this episode, we're going to explore how the coffee shop has changed the world but also whether it still has what it takes to change the world. I'm James Harper, documentary maker and the creator of the Filter Stories Coffee Podcast. And I'm Jonathan Morris, professional historian and author of Coffee, A Global History. And this is the second series of A History of Coffee, a podcast that explores how a tiny psychoactive seed changed the world and continues to shape our lives today. And so, we're back again now in uh, Cafe 1001 in, in mm -hmm. super trendy Shoreditch. Here we are. Uh, Ranchilio machine is going great guns in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to take the opportunity to thank Ranchilio for their support in producing this free educational resource for the entire coffee community yeah. to understand coffee history. Yeah, it's honestly, without their support, we couldn't have sunk in the hundreds and hundreds of hours that it takes to make this sort of podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't know, Ranchilio produce espresso machines for the cafe and the home. The technology in them I've always found to be quite innovative. For example, they have temperature profiling technology where you can begin your extraction at 88, go up to 93. And for me, when I worked for a roastery, it really unlocked new ways of pulling interesting flavors out of my espressos. That's interesting. For me, Ranchilio has always been about Ranchilio Silvia, mm -hmm. a machine that really transformed home brewing and indeed was the first espresso machine I had in my house, James. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that's why I learned to make espresso the way I did. They basically put professional components into a home coffee machine. That's exactly why it's so good. So if you are in the market for a high quality home espresso machine or for your cafe, 
to Consider Rancilio. By supporting them, you're also supporting us making this podcast. So thank you very much. We have a link in the show notes. Please do that. And now let's get back to the story, James. So Jonathan, we know that in Mecca, in the early 1500s, coffee is being drank publicly, like you would maybe at a picnic. But when do we actually have the first coffee house? So we have a manuscript that certainly identifies a coffee house by 1534 being opened in Damascus and in Istanbul in 1554. I really want to get a flavor of what these early coffee houses would have looked like. Let's go to Istanbul, down by the harbour where you'd be looking over the Bosphorus and you'd have a coffee house and you might go in the garden and have your coffee and kind of look over the evening. You'd be out on the sort of the, the promenades, you know, down by the jetties and so forth. You could go into one of the rooms. You've got these luxury sofas. You'd probably see poets trying their work out on each other. You'd see merchants discussing the deal that they were right, going right. to do, but maybe doing it over a game of backgammon. But then a lot of what you would see as government officials. The bureaucrat. The bureaucrat. And of course, you know, again, bureaucrats doing, as it were, business that involves a lot of entertaining, but also might involve a little bit of brown nosing or... Yeah. Networking is networking, James. It's got to be done. So it sounds like coffee houses in Istanbul at the time are very popular. In Istanbul, we went from having, you know, the first coffee house in 1554... Mm. By, say, 40 years after that, we've got about 600. Hold the phone, hold the phone. You're saying in 40 years, 600 new cafes opened? I'm saying 600 places that were called coffee houses, yeah. Wow. So, Jonathan, here we have a picture of a lot of different people meeting haphazardly in these coffee houses that are springing up across the Middle East, Turkey, discussing many ideas... Maybe some ideas that the people in power don't like. Back in Mecca, you know, when coffee was first introduced, the governor there saw it as quite a threat. And I can imagine the governor of Istanbul, was he equally threatened? Well, of course, you know, you refer to the governor of Istanbul, but we're talking about the sultan of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> or quite well. You know, we're at a whole different <laughs> level. Next level, okay. A whole different level, my friend, of authority at this point. And the answer is yes. Suleiman the Magnificent is the uh, sultan who is in power at the time that this first coffee house is opened. Mm. And again, within about 10 years, was saying, oh, you, you know, we want controls on these. We want to shut them down because they're distracting people from their correct activities. Hmm. He actually issues a decree in coffee houses. People are continuing to pass their time by amusing themselves and committing illicit and banned acts that prevent them from carrying out their religious obligations. Hold on. So he's saying people who are in coffee houses are doing things which are illicit, banned. <laughs> like, like what? There are various possibilities there. We know that there was gambling. <laughs> There's a hint here about boza, alcohol. The other thing that becomes really problematic in Ottoman society, and that's smoking. Oh, really? Tobacco. Huh. I mean, smoking tobacco is a weird one because, I mean, today we know how bad it is for our health. I can't imagine they knew back then. So why was it a problem? If people are smoking in coffee shops, this creates a fire hazard. And a fire hazard is a big thing, right? Because all the buildings are made of wood. Mm. And actually, in 1633, there's a big fire that destroys five districts of Istanbul. And it's believed that that was started by smoking tobacco in a coffee house. So Murad basically says that every coffee shop has to be closed, right? Huh. And he sends orders to the rest of the empire saying the same thing. Huh. So I'm going to quote you the order. Yeah. <laughs> okay. From now on, anyone who opens a coffee shop should be strung up over its front door. <laughs> My goodness me. Wow. Okay, let me be clear about this. So yeah. he's using the pretext of fire and smoking in a coffee shop to close it down across you know, the empire he controls. Yes. I mean, it feels a little extreme. If you're concerned about fire risks, you're going to string up the owners of coffee shops for daring to open one? Is fire the thing he's really concerned about? We can say that Murad was an extreme autocrat. Mm. He came to the throne very young. He came to the throne as a minor in the, in the 1620s. So mm. he probably has distinct paranoia. Right. 
But coffee shops have been around for almost 100 years now at this point. How do you ban something after 100 years it's been around? Well, I mean, there's some interesting things about this ban, right? It's more effective in Istanbul than elsewhere. Mm. And that takes me to the point that I really want to make, which is soldiers are very big patrons of coffee houses. So if the people who you employ to shut down the coffee houses are the people who most like the coffee houses, to the point that there was an estimate that about 40% of coffee houses were owned by state officials. This is not going to work, is it? perhaps unsurprising <laughs> that it doesn't really work out that well. So, Jonathan, we saw how coffee spread through the Ottoman Empire. Coffee shops exploded in what is today Istanbul. Yeah. And I know at some point, obviously, it reaches Europe because, you know, I can go down the stairs of my house and get a coffee today. So, um, <laughs> Well observed, James. That's what I call deduction. <laughs> um, so how did the coffee shop concept go from the Ottoman Empire to Europe? People who set up the first coffee shops are usually emigres from the Ottoman Empire, generically described as Armenians. <laughs> are they actually from Armenia? Well, this is the point. In this period, okay, anyone who is an Orthodox Christian but living under the Ottoman Empire is quite often described as Armenian. Oh. So the first people who open coffee houses in Vienna are Armenians. The first people who sell coffee in Paris in the markets are identified as Armenians. Okay, so coffee shops are now being brought into Europe by so-called Armenians, Orthodox Christians from the Ottoman Empire. We've seen some of the ways they were disruptive in the Ottoman Empire. What's their impact in Europe? So listen, let me tell you about my hero, the man who I've named my fantasy football team after. You don't seriously have a fantasy football team, do you? I seriously have a fantasy football team, <laughs> and it is seriously called the Pascra Rose 11. Are you serious? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, <laughs> listen, Pascra Rose was a manservant to an English trader. He came back from the port city of Izmir. So that's on the Aegean. That's the kind of, you know, Western Turkey. And we know he comes to London, 1652. He opens up actually what is really a coffee stall. A stall? You know those Christmas markets, James? Yeah. Yeah, imagine something like that, a little hut. Uh -huh. okay. okay, so there's a courtyard around this church and he's got his little hut in there. He's one of many people who do. And where exactly is the church? So he is just opposite the Royal Exchange building. And what exactly is the Royal Exchange? It's like a massive trading floor. Huh. So, because there are all those merchants in the exchange, mm. and quite often they're chatting away and doing all those things that merchants do. Money. Yes. Money, deals, networking, brown nosing, etc. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they often, it appears, walk out of the exchange, go into the church courtyard and get a coffee together from Pasca Rose in his stall. Huh. I'm imagining men with wigs stockings perhaps in a churchyard and i mean we're talking the 1650s here so yeah. it must have been absolutely filthy <laughs> like <laughs> london up there, muddy and filthy yeah uh fair enough yes we don't have paved roads so we're having sort of detritus everywhere oh, we man. don't have sewers and this of course is very important because you know the general lack of hygiene mm. means that you have to be very careful what you drink oh yeah right because you're not just going to drink water, especially not water in a city. You know, I mean, there, there are rivers. There's a river mm -hmm. in London, the Fleet, which is right close to that, you know, becomes subsequently paved mm -hmm. over Fleet Street. That, oh, the Fleet Street was a river? The Fleet was a river. Oh, really? Oh, but wow. of course, the Fleet's a river, but it's also a sewer, a washing place, the whole lot. <laughs> right. And in terms of drinking, they're very careful. Mm. What they mostly drink is what's known technically as small beer. So it's very light fermented alcoholic drinks. Mm. And they do that because, of course, when you prepare those drinks, you boil the water before you do the fermenting. Oh, I see. So it's part of the brewing process. By boiling the water, they're killing the germs. Now, coffee, bang, this is a safe drink. you got to boil water too to make coffee. And it's not going to get you slightly more drowsy. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine caffeine is 
also a major selling point. Absolutely. So we were talking about my friend, Mr. Pasqua Rosé. Mm. Mr. Rosé had published a handbill, which was called The Virtue of the Coffee Drink. Huh. And what he says is, coffee is a sweet little innocent thing. It will prevent drowsiness and make one fit for business. It will hinder sleep for three or four hours. It will make you watchful. Pasqua Rosé seems to have also figured out marketing. Yeah, it's a great example of marketing. I mean, there are some other great claims in this pamphlet. Oh, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. So in Turkey, where coffee is generally drunk, they're not troubled with the stone, gout, dropsy, or scurvy, and their skins are exceedingly clear and white. Now, <laughs> what? there you go. Those are all the advantages of drinking coffee. I mean, I believed him in that first snippet you delivered. Yeah. But now he's just talking quackery. Now he's bona fide snake oil salesman. <laughs> well, indeed. But, you know, they didn't have much in the way of advertising standards in those days. <laughs> oh, my God. So, Mr. Rosé here, he's got his shack outside of a church. His coffee business is going pretty well, I'm imagining. He's very good at marketing. So, what happens next? What happens is that, yeah, I mean, this is successful enough that Rosé is able to move from his coffee stall mm -hmm. and he basically takes on a suite of rooms in pretty much in that same square and creates a coffee house. And famously, this coffee house has a silhouette of Rosé outside oh. in his Turkish headdress. Oh, really? And we assume that he probably wore that kind of stuff when he was serving quite often that he would have worn, you know, costume oh, really? befitting of, of an Ottoman. Jonathan, we want to go into a coffee house. What are we going to see? Come in, we're going to sit down. We'll probably be asked, do we have any news? Do we have anything to discuss? We will look around us. We will see a fire in the corner mm -hmm. with a relatively large brewing pot on it. Mm -hmm. That's where the coffee itself will be being made. Coffee is ground to the powder, it's boiled up with spring water and about half a pint of it is then drunk as hot as possibly can be endured. <laughs> so bring your um, oh asbestos tongue with you, okay? <laughs> and we'll have a waiter come over and he'll give us what will be called our dish each of coffee. Huh. Uh, now a dish was the word of the time, it's a really a small bowl, it's very small. Like an espresso sized cup? Not that much bigger, hmm. yeah. The price of our coffee is going to be a penny. Bargain? Absolute bargain. So these coffee houses became known as penny universities. Mm. Penny for the coffee, learn all the stuff that you can. I see. Now, what will we see going on? We'll see a lot of debate going on. Hmm. We may see some sort of quite organised debates going on. There were coffee houses, I think it was called the Rota, which was the first to introduce something really strange called the ballot box. Oh, yeah. They would arrange their tables in a sort of a kind of semicircular fashion so that you can have a debate around the tables. Mm. So with nobody favoured. And then you could have a motion and you could ask who was in favour. And you could pass around this box and you put your vote in, the ballot box. Sounds like democracy to me. Yeah. We could perhaps start looking for some kind of pamphlets or, for want of a better word, newspapers mm -hmm. that eventually we would find coffee houses that produce newspapers. Oh, right. So, uh, The Spectator, the magazine that I imagine you're still aware of. I've heard of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Begins production in the 1700s in a coffee house. Wow. To use a great academic term, James, this is co-production because the key to the success of the coffee house, if you think about it even today, is the coffee house is co-produced by the people who consume there. Oh. I mean, you build the theatre, you build the stage, you start the environment, but actually those people who come there create the experience. They co-create it with you. Huh. I mean, not dissimilar to the business model of, you know, a social media company. You spend time on the app to see what other people are talking about. Yeah. So... What kind of <laughs> creators, <laughs> influencers, content creators <laughs> did we have in the uh, 1650s? Well, there's one absolutely key piece of content, and that is news, news, news. Now, news takes many forms, so let's call it huh. news and information. It's really an information exchange. Right. So it seems like Pascal Rosé having his 
coffee house near the Royal Exchange, which is the place where things are bought and sold in like kind of wholesale quantities. Talk about location. And that's the way, really, that this whole business takes off. Hmm. Yeah, because coffee houses become associated almost with their clientele. Hmm. Now, I'm very fond of a coffee house called Jonathan's for fairly obvious <laughs> reasons. But Jonathan's is the place where the London Stock Exchange is effectively born. Oh, yeah. Do you know why Jonathan's exists? No. It exists because the stock jobbers of the time were too rude and noisy to be allowed in the Royal Exchange. Basically, they were considered, you know, ill-mannered people. Hold on. What is a stock jobber? A stock jobber is somebody who trades stocks. Huh. But this is about civilised behaviour. And these people are not very civilised. Okay. So the point is that, you know, these guys reconvene mm. in Jonathan's Coffee House. Mm. So after a while, of course, you have to go to Jonathan's Coffee House because if you want to be trading, you've got to be in the right place to do the trade. I mean, it's just like, you know, the Facebook page for whatever community you want to be a part of. That's the place to be. Yeah. But it happens to be serving coffee at the same time. I mean, there are loads of things like that. The Baltic Exchange oh. is another one you know, hiring of ships. And then, of course, I've got to insure those ships. So where am I going to go? I'm going to go to Lloyd's Coffee House. Right. Opens in, uh, I think, 1688. This is the way that the coffee house becomes not just much more than about drinking coffee. It's the way it becomes a business model for the exchange and co-production that I'm talking about. Fascinating. You know, Jonathan's works because of the people who go to Jonathan's. Right. I think what we should also say is these coffee houses... Mm. As they develop, it's not just about mercantile stuff. Mm. As they spread, they become the centres of many other things. Mm. So you have a whole second group of people who have become known in the literature as the virtuosi. Oh, yeah. Virtuosi. People who are, to be blunt, cultured. Mm. I mean, culture and science and stuff are all very blended at this point. Mm -hmm. They want really to learn about stuff. Mm and exchange their knowledge and their information and put forward their thoughts and theorems, many of which are completely bonkers. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, everyone gets a shot. I was about to say, just like anybody listening to podcasts today, would you say they're virtuosi? Maybe not with the bonkers bit. Actually, entirely with the bonkers <laughs> bit. But uh, yeah, in a way, I think so. I think people who listen a lot to podcasts, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So name me some virtuosi I might recognise. You're thinking about people like Francis Bacon. Uh, there's mm. a coffee house in Oxford where they would have had Isaac Newton. Wow. Edmund Haley of Haley's Comet. Huh. Sloan, collect guy who ends up founding the British Museum. Yeah. These people are all coffee house aficionados. You have places like the Grecian Coffee House, which turns into the Royal Society. <laughs> and the Royal Society was like an early scientific institution? Well, that's right. The Royal Society still is a scientific institution. My point is that the Grecian Coffee House is the forerunner of the Royal mm. Society. It's where the Royal Society as a society <laughs> meets mm. before the Royal Society acquires its own premises and buildings. Wow. So if I were to zoom out and look at the impact of coffee, it created essentially a sober environment, a caffeinated environment where people could do commerce and exchange ideas. Yeah. And that permitted like a flourishing of ideas and institutions which resonate through to today. Yeah, in essence, the coffee house is trading in far more than coffee. And actually, the key thing that is consumed is the coffee house itself, not the coffee. So, Jonathan, you've shown me how the coffee house really fueled commerce and intellectual thought in England. But what about the political side? Because as coffee shops became more popular in the Ottoman Empire, you know, some rulers saw them as a threat to their power. Was that also the case in England? Actually, yes. Coffee houses did play a significant role in English politics. But I think to understand that, we need to think about the English Civil War. Now, James... You did a history degree. What do you know about the English Civil War? It wasn't on the English Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> right, quick lesson about the Civil War. In the 1630s, King Charles I 
basically suspends Parliament for a long time. He rules by decree. One of the reasons that he does that, perhaps the main one, is to impose a particular form of religion upon the country. Uh He is opposed by Parliament, Mm -hmm. which eventually rises up against the king. Mm -hmm. And this leads to a civil war, Mm. which lasts until eventually Parliament triumphs, the king is captured, and in 1649, he is executed. Right. Why does this matter? Because when Pasqua Rosé and others open their first coffee houses in London, Mm -hmm. we have no king. The king is dead, Ah. beheaded, there is no monarchy. Okay. The country is being led by a guy called Oliver Cromwell with the support of Parliament. However, in 1660, after the death of Cromwell and the falling apart of Cromwell's regime, the monarchy is restored with Charles II put on the throne, Charles II being the son of Charles I. Hold the phone, hold the phone, hold the phone. So a king does a religious-inspired power grab. Yep. The quote-unquote lay people, parliamentarians, rebel fight a bloody war, yeah. kill the guy. Yeah. The guy they install, Oliver Cromwell, does fine, but passes away. Yeah. And then they go back, well, okay, was the king really that bad? Let's just bring another king back in. Very roughly, yes. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is after the king comes back to power, in 1666, the Earl of Clarendon, his leading minister, mm-hmm. let's call him, says, well, you know... There are lots of people who are still talking about you who want to get rid of you because, of course, it's not like he comes back and everyone says it's wonderful, okay? Right. Clarendon therefore advises, why not close the coffee houses? Because let's face it, you know, there's a lot of gossip about you, etc. Oh, and Clarendon has to be reminded that, first of all, lots of royalists also used coffee houses, oh. particularly during the Civil War. It's like saying, hey, let's just shut off the internet because people are saying bad things about us. It's like, yeah, yeah, but we need the internet too. Exactly. So what does the king do? Is he so insecure that he decides to uh, shut it all down? No, he backs off. Ah, wise move. Has another think about it in the 1670s. Oh, really? And backs off again. Oh, really? This is not doable. Mm. And that, of course, parallels what we had talked about already, no? Mm-hmm. In the Ottoman Empire. All those sultans who, you know close the coffee houses but the coffee houses survive the genie is out of the bottle (laughs) you can't stuff it back in (laughs) exactly that so jonathan you've shown me how coffee houses of the past were used as meeting places Many people over the ages didn't like the fact people were talking about their authority and wanted to shut them down. And we also saw how coffee houses were places for great learning and civil society discourse, dare I say it, democracy, the future of countries were discussed in coffee houses. And up until now, this has all been quite old history. But um, for once, I would actually like to tell you a story about the role of the coffee houses in more recent history. I'm intrigued, James. Tell me. So back in January 2022, I had my uh, first proper holiday since beginning my life as a documentary podcast audio producer. And I spent two weeks in Egypt. Oh, right. And for a couple of days, I was staying in the center of Cairo. Uh Uh-huh. So you have to imagine where I was, which is you know, just down the road from Tahrir Square, right. the center of the city. Yeah. yeah huge, you know, 15-story high, crumbling gray apartment blocks. There were streets choked with traffic. And as I was exploring Cairo, I came across a lot of cafes on the street. People having coffee on the streets. Oh, right. Quite a number all around Tahrir Square, right, right in the center where I was staying. Yeah. And these aren't trendy cafes as we understand them. Actually, in Egyptian Arabic, they're known as Ahwa, which basically just means coffee. Literally a very informal place just to have coffee on the street. But for the rest of the story, I'll just refer to them as street cafes. Now, I want to share a story about the role that these cafes had in a moment in Egyptian history 
10 years ago, which was quite momentous. And I was made aware of the story of the street cafes when I met someone called Sara, not her real name. I'm going to hide it for reasons that will become obvious. I write all the time or most of the time. So And we connected over a story that she had wrote about her journey to try and change her family's attitudes towards women and women's role in society. So uh, mostly it would be like um, meditation about life, about people in my life, about what I'm looking for. And what you got to know about Sarah is that back in 2011, she was still a teenager and finishing school in Cairo. Mm -hmm. And as we know, 2011, when Sarah's finishing school, is a pivotal year for Egypt. We do have breaking news tonight from Cairo, where after a day of unprecedented violence, the night gives way to armed chaos. 2011, as I recall, is the height of the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. We actually see a spread of a popular movement against the rulers in many of those countries. In Egypt in particular, of course, it's the long-standing Mubarak regime. Why were people upset with Mubarak? Intense corruption, repression, police dictatorship. And the guy's in power for a long time, 30 years. Yeah. So early 2011, huge demonstrations in Tahrir Square. I understand that there's a statement now. I'll see you both. And after many, many weeks of these mass protests, the protesters, they've received the news that Mubarak is giving up. President Hosni Mubarak has decided to step down as president uh, uh, of uh, Egypt. And he has this is shocking news for everybody, including Sarah. I was as surprised as every other Egyptian in Egypt. And nobody had any idea what happens next. It was scary, it was uh, exciting. And so Sarah told me there's just like this explosion of political activity in the country. It was in the universities, it was in the Tahrir School itself. It was on the coffee shops, it was on a newspaper, like everything. Because people were silent for 30 years. So afterward, everyone wanted to talk. Now, soon after this, Sarah goes to study at university in Cairo. And even in her first year at university, she regularly goes down, like many people do, to Tahrir Square. Uh, we would go to the Tahrir Square, we would uh, have the protest. Uh-huh. And then after spending some time on the square, you know, raising placards, assembling, shouting for this demand and that demand, many people, including Sarah herself, would disperse from Tahrir Square, which is this very large roundabout near the River Nile, and filter their way through all the side streets nearby, like near where I was staying, and go to the outdoor cafes. Because that's where people talk. And during this period, she describes like these outdoor cafes became a center of intense political discussion. Everyone was there and everyone wanted to participate and the energy was so high. People were talking very loudly. They were all enthusiastic. And you really had almost every political persuasion represented. So you had the liberals and you had the lefties and you had the people who were saying that they are communists. And they would literally debate, debate, debate. And people would be like, no, we want this more and this is more uh, important or this is less, less important. And while these debates are going on, really about the future of Egypt, you know, the seating in these outdoor cafes was perfectly conducive for this sort of discussion. So in between these tall 10, 15 story apartment buildings, you have an alleyway and it's filled with brightly colored plastic chairs and these small wooden tables. And you could form whatever configuration of seating you wanted. You could make these massive groups or you could split off and form smaller groups. Maybe we could be like 20 people and with a very, very small table. And the way Sada describes it, it's like the future of Egypt is being debated on the streets in this extremely kind of democratic way, where literally the price of admission is your time and a cup of coffee. Because it was really cheap, you could sit there for a long time, every day. James, I mean, that is the English coffee house. We were talking about the English coffee house. Bang, same thing. Mm -hmm the revolutionary sense of that space. Mm. We talked about co-producing, didn't we? And it, it is co-production there. You've got mm. the coffee, but you've got the, the space. You've got the ability to shape that space from the people who are there to use that space in the ways that they want. Yeah, absolutely. And you know how you mentioned how the English coffee houses were sometimes referred to as penny universities? Yeah. Pay a little bit for the coffee and get an education. That's right. There are echoes of that 
in Sarah's experience. I formed a lot of my beliefs like this. I mean, this is how people learn. This is how people evolve through like talking and uh, trying and being fools and being uh, ridiculous and so on. So of course, that's how we grow. So James, I mean, this is fascinating because we're listening to sort of history as it's made, as it were, but I do know this is 10 years ago, so tell us what happened next. So these protests at Tahrir Square and these really fervent debates are taking place in the cafes. It goes on across 2011, 2012, but over time, these different factions do start getting violent. At that point, we had a huge conflict with the Muslim Brotherhood. People were throwing stones at each other. And for me, if you want to um, harm someone physically, that's my limit. I will not participate in this. And once things started getting violent, people stopped debating one another in the street cafes. The more violent it gets, the less people talk. And then soon after, there is another thing that has happened to coffee shops historically that also happens in Egypt. Suspend the constitution. The political details are long and complicated, but the major change is when there is essentially a coup d'etat. So, uh, the Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi, is out. He is no longer the president of Egypt. Egypt becomes a military dictatorship under a guy called Sisi, still in power today. And one thing Sisi does not tolerate is any political opposition. No, exactly. Which begins a very sad chapter in Sarah's life. Many of her friends were imprisoned, disappeared. I had the impression it was still very fresh, extremely traumatic. So I didn't want to go into the details, but... Um, yeah. yeah, but I don't think you need to, James, because we know that this is still the case. Sorry, I mean, anyone who's listening to this will know that there are many people who have been imprisoned in Egypt for what are, in effect, political reasons. Yeah. And something that I found very chilling about this period immediately, you know, following the coup d'etat, the Sisi regime went on a witch hunt. They wanted to crush dissenting views. So obviously they went on the internet and scoured social media, but they also went to cafes. Well, because the cafes were a place where people are gathering, talking and assembling. It was also a target place for a crackdown. So the same places that were once a safe place were now a source of danger. And I heard stories of cafes that I was sitting in, for example, having video cameras installed. And they'd identify the people who were in the cafes, in those groups discussing politics, and then they would find them later and then imprison them. It's almost as if we're retelling that story of, of Murad the Fourth, five hundred years later. Yeah, no, exactly so. For me, one of the sad elements of this is that the cafes, which were a place for thriving political discourse and new, you know, a new Egypt, nowadays the way Sarah describes them to me, you know, they've lost their soul. Sterile. Do you think people would ever feel comfortable talking in a coffee shop again? Uh, no. Nope. Nope. Not here, not anywhere. But Jonathan, you know, in this story about Egypt, there's one final facet to the history of the coffee shop that still rings true, as it has done for centuries. On a typical chilly January Cairo evening, I was crisscrossing the streets around Tahir Square and found one of these street cafes and took one of the last seats available. The entire alleyway, side to side, was completely filled, certainly over 100 people. This was literally the same street cafe that Sarah would go, where all this political discourse took place, you know, a decade ago. Sarah told me that she herself would never come back to this cafe because, you know, it's associated with so many painful memories. But this coffee shop, it lives on. 
and it seemed to me to be doing a thriving trade. This is kind of history repeating itself. Mm. People are still going to coffee houses to drink coffee. The Sisi regime, it hasn't banned coffee, hasn't banned coffee houses. No. It knows that would be too unpopular. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, this is the regime learning to live with the coffee house. So Jonathan, we're back in Cafe 1001. And you know, when we started this episode, I did question whether cafes could play that transformative role that they have played in the past. Because, you know, with social media, with digital ways of communicating, I mean, how does a cafe compete with that? But it was only after seeing the role of cafes as meeting spaces in Egypt during the revolution that actually began to change my mind. What I would say, James, is, you know, the coffee shop, you know, still has a function. I mean, when times get tough, when we are trying to think about new ways of acting, new behaviours, when we're trying to deal with things externally, the coffee shop provides a point of reference for us, provides a place where we can go and meet, discuss our ideas, still has an important role for society today. So, thanks for listening to the first episode of this new second series of uh, the History of Coffee podcast. So, Jonathan, what's coming up in the next episode? Well, James, we're going to talk about a quite dark story, the dark story of Haiti, Mm. the effects of colonialism on Haiti, how it became essentially one of France's wealthiest slave plantations growing coffee, Hmm. how Haiti fell into revolution, Mm. and how colonialism, racism have kept Haiti poor even up to today now if you're listening on my filter stories channel that will come out in two weeks but if you want to hear it right now head to the a history of coffee channel link in the show notes where we have the entire second series out right now so James I'm sure that people when listening to the episode are trying to imagine things in their head what things look like mm-hmm. I'm going to put some illustrations around English coffee houses and of course my fantasy football team hero Mr. Rosé on my social media, Instagram at Coffee History JM. I'll be doing the same on my Instagram, which is at Filter Stories Podcast, and I will share images that I took from Egypt so you can see what the street cafes look like. And of course, folks, if you want to get more into coffee history, please buy a copy of my book, Coffee A Global History. Link in the show notes. And um, if you enjoyed what you heard, tell your friends about it. Also, press subscribe on your podcast player. You can write a review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps the algorithms. Suggest this to people who like history or coffee. And something else that's super cool, if you have an Instagram account, take a screen grab of yourself listening to this episode and then post it as a story. And I'll repost it so I can give you direct thanks. Maybe you will do the same thing, Jonathan? Of course I will. (laughs) Of course I will. Um, James, there's an important thanks I want to make, and that's to Rancilio. Mm Mm-hmm who enable us to create this free educational content about the history of coffee. Without them, we couldn't put this together. Absolutely not. So another way to support the show is to support Ranchilio. And if you're in the market for a home espresso machine or even a coffee machine for your bar, uh, we have a link in the show notes. So A History of Coffee was produced by me, James Harper, and yourself, Jonathan Morris. I edited the series and also write and play the piano music. And uh, meanwhile, 
dear listener. Uh, next time you're in a coffee house, maybe you want to think about fermenting a revolution. <laughs> Start a riot. <laughs>